Hello, I'm Paul Cargan here with Dr. Anna Louise Keating, who's director of and professor in the Multicultural Women's and Gender Study Doctoral Program at Texas University, uh, Texas Women's University, author and editor of a great many books. Um, and just to mention a couple highlights, Dr. Keating edited um, and brought to publication Gloria Anzaldúa's uh, last book, um, Light in the Dark, Luz en lo Oscuro, Rewriting Identity, Spirituality, and Reality, which is one of my favorite books of all. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, and and co-edited with Anzaldúa, The Womanist Anthology, This Bridge We Call Home, Radical Visions for Transformation. Um, and she has agreed to talk with me today about her book, um, Teaching Transformation, Transcultural Classroom Dialogues. Um, Anna Louise, thanks for talking with me. Well, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I On the first page, to, to jump right in, uh, of the preface, um, you, you said something that really resonated with my experience teaching, um, which is that you, you recount beginning teaching yourself. And you say, um, when I started teaching, I was passionate about the material I taught because it had empowered me. I assumed that it would automatically empower my students as well. And I, I feel like I felt that same thing. And then you found that that was not the case. Um, I wonder if you might, Tell me a little bit more about those those early uh, experiences teaching that were that didn't turn out the way you anticipated them to. Yeah. Um, so the background would be I was teaching U.S. American literature um, and composition, and I was you know I was so I would teach in something like an essay by Ralph Waldo Emerson, and um, I found his for example his. Um, theory of self-reliance and his kind of encouragement to kind of like have this kind of self-trust, I found that totally empowering. Um, and my students were just like, some of them were just like completely not taken with it. I don't know if it's because they had that self-trust or because he just was a very wordy author and so they didn't want to read it. Um, or even like a short story like um, J.D. Salinger that I just found like super like amazing. Like my students, it just, it just some of them, it just didn't resonate with. Um, and so I, I just had to figure out different strategies in different ways and just find out like where they were and what did interest them and kind of figure out how to kind of meet them where they were at. Um, yeah, so, so kind of like, that like I, I I just helped me understand like how do I not impose my views how do I not assume my students are like me in terms of their interests but how do I also encourage them to actually be open enough to see what's going on in a text right so with teaching um, composition I tried to approach it from the idea of um, writing and writing learning how to write effectively as almost a form of liberation or just things like that and and it and they just they weren't buying it um when i when i started to reframe it or when i would say like you know what is the most what is the most interesting passage to you in this why is this interesting to you um and sometimes it was it was often i found a matter of um giving them questions before they read and not the kind of question like what does emerson mean by self-reliance but what struck you, you know, what sentence did you love or did you like or did you find interesting or what is one passage that you had a question about? So I kind of, I, it, it's that idea of, um, a, it's a kind of co-creation. It's co-creating the classroom space. We're creating it in dialogue. I'm not gonna tell them what's important. I'm gonna ask them what they find to be important. And then sometimes it might even be a matter of, um, why do you think this essay is so famous if it was Emerson? Why is this? Why is this text read by a lot of people? Why do you suppose it's in this anthology? Like, not uh, so. Again, never anything with one answer, but something that would kind of ask them to think more deeply and to put it in some kind of context. In that, in that same um, first page of the preface, we, we, you you say that in your in your quest to become a better teacher, you. Um, Immersed your, I immersed myself in existing scholarship on pedagogy, multiculturalism, 
and social justice teaching. Uh, and I, I'm curious where that impulse to turn to the scholarship on teaching came from, because I think I think so many teachers, that's not the default. Uh, even though we're scholars of other things, we don't automatically turn to the scholarship on teaching. What what led you to that, or made you think of, hey, there could be some answers here? <laughs> I think my whole life, I've gone to books for answers. Um, I think it was, you know, um, I used to be. I mean, I was raised in a very I was raised in a very conservative Protestant household. And so like my family kind of really had a lot of reverence for the Bible. So mm -hmm. a book is having answers. And then even after I like moved through Christianity, um, because all my degrees are in English, I just had a lot of like, um, I was always looking for like answers in books. So I assume scholars might. And then like when I started reading um, critical race theory or when I was reading whiteness studies, I was astonished at how many scholars never thought about teaching. It was amazing to me. How do you like, what are you going to do with this material? You can't just drop it in a classroom. Like, how are you going to do it? So therefore, when I found like someone like Bell Hooks, who was like talking about teaching, it was super important to me because then I had something that I could put into dialogue with, um, well, you know, what I was doing in a classroom. What is she doing in a classroom? I, I I love that. Um, it, the next the next thing I want to ask you about is you you describe the approach that you then developed and came to as a, a pedagogy of invitation, uh, and and you contrast that's on page X I, and you, and you contrast that with with oppositional pedagogies or or later in the book you say pedagogies of of persuasion. I guess, which are take a more aggressive approach where invitations more hands open. And I, and I really like that term um, invitation because in, in my own dissertation, I, I wrote a little, a coda on the end kind of describing poetry as an invitation. Um, so just that, that language resonated with me um, a bit. And you, you, you describe it in terms of things like, um, uh, on, on 45, I marked a couple quotes down. Um, you you talk about um, beginning explorations of difference by focusing on commonalities. That that whole chapter is about starting with commonalities versus starting with differences. And and you talk about um, when students are wrong, slowing down and taking a less adversarial approach. Um, I wonder if you might unpack a bit more about that, that pedagogies of in, invitation, which you, you don't use that phrase much more, I think, but it, the spirit of that seems throughout the book. So, yeah, I mean, I think I, I would have to like look at dates of things, but I feel like I came across the phrase pretty late in writing the book. And I came across the phrase because I was on a dissertation committee, um, Krista Downer, in fact, and she talked about or she like referred to or she called what I was doing, like she compared it to um, invitational rhetoric. And then I read about invitational rhetoric and I was like, wow, that's what I'm doing. I'm doing a form of that, but in teaching. Because I learned pretty quickly, you can't, it, like it's not successful to impose things on students, right? Um, I, it's really important to have, um, like when I pick a text, there's, there's reasons I pick it and there's things I hope students will learn. And I like to tell them, this is why we're, here's some of the reasons that we're using this book. Here's why I picked this book, um, because that also kind of functions as invitation. But then it's up to them what they will take and what they don't. And it, part of it is that idea of teaching is sowing the seeds. We don't know. I mean, and, and the number of times I've had people come back like years later and be like, your class was super important to me. Um, here's what I learned. I hated Anzal Dua the whole time I was in your class, but hey, will you direct my master's thesis on her or you know will you do this or you know so so I never so I never assume anything really about what students are going to get or not get but I hope for the best and I and I assume the best in them in the sense that I hope they will I hope what I'm teaching what I'm offering them I hope something will resonate with them in whatever way like fits with their life so it's also like assuming like the best about human nature in a sense mm -hmm. right um, so that's the invitational part, and it is. It's like, honestly, as much as possible, it's how I try to live my life, as invitation, not as imposing. 
it it seems a you said not not doing that is not successful so it seems likely to be more effective yes. but it, it seems also just a, a more gentle gracious way to live with yourself so as if if students don't accept what you're teaching well that's okay that doesn't take away from what, who you are or what you've done yeah yeah right right it's never a good idea as a teacher or as a human being to get our sense of identity from other people right because then when they let us down we feel bad or we act out or whatever and the other thing is i like i don't know what's really best for somebody else right so just because they're not getting like what i think is like important points doesn't mean they're not getting other things that given their context and their you know their whole relational identities aren't super important to them so i do have this i do kind of go into it with this faith that they will get something out of it you know um at, at one point in your book you you um you make a, a critique of how how social justice topics are often taught or, or categories such as race or, or gender. Um, you, so on one hand, you completely agree that this kind of colorblind, let's not talk about these categories approach is not going to work. Right. And on, yeah. on the other hand, um, I was really challenged personally by your concern for how um, that if we, if we, we could, we could accidentally go the other way, right. Too far. And, and, treat these these concepts as if they were reality and and you say on um, on 69 right you, you, how, how can we um kind of teach about these categories without inadvertently reinforcing stereotypes boundaries and other arbitrary divisions um and i i, I wonder if you might tell me a bit about how, how you how do you see traditional ways of teaching about race as as inadvertently reinforcing race or, or these other categories. And I'm, I would imagine that within, whether it's, I would, I want to take away the word traditional ways, right? Okay. Because I think there's probably many ways to teach it in many ways it has been taught. And I want to think about it as the idea that sometimes the way we produce new knowledge is by holding contradiction and we hold the contradiction. And I think teaching about many of these social identity categories involves really holding the contradiction. So, it's it's a so it's teaching the history of the terms so students understand that all, a lot of the labels we use now they're not natural in the sense like people are born these ways the, there's histories behind these terms and those histories are often just shot through with all sorts of power dynamics right so then then we can start thinking about it a little more intentionally not to get rid of them and not to say it's not real but to say, here's how we got to this reality, right? And then we can look at how stereotypes can function. So the assumption so quickly, especially like, a lot of times, especially with students, it, oh, I mean, like actually probably not. That's just where I live my life, right? Lots of people, right? It's easy, it's easy to think in categories and we're taught it from so young. I remember like, like seeing my daughters like stuff in kindergarten and first grade, make a list put the dead things on this side, you know, what's alive and what's not alive, or what's a boy and what's a girl, or, I mean, we're just taught this all the time, so I want to kind of, like, start teasing that apart and just think about how the categories kind of, like, can be permeable, and, you know, because stereotypes do the opposite of that. They just put everybody in a category, and then they assume everybody is, like, whatever that category is, so, so that's why I would, I would take texts that kind of challenge that. You have, you have an Anzal Dua you know, she is Chicana, but look at these ways she's going beyond that category. Look at these ways she's pushing it, or Audre Lorde, or, you know, whatever. So we can kind of think about the complexity. And then that's what I mean by commonalities. I don't mean sameness, right? I, but I also don't mean like binary difference. I mean, commonality is relational. Difference. And that's how I like to teach race or gender or sexuality. In these ways, it kind of like, to talk about a category as fluid doesn't mean it doesn't have real impact, right? So, so that's how I'm, and and I think that if I was writing, rewriting the book, I would be more nuanced, um, you know. Yeah. So, so or so like, when I I used to teach U.S. Women of Colors before our doctoral program, 
And the way I taught it was I started by talking about racism. And I talked about it specifically in the context of the history of U.S. feminism. And I talked about, you know, so then we would look at different ways that different women of color had addressed questions of racism. So we'd start with this bridge called my back, right? And then we'd, or actually I think, no, we would start a little more historical. I think I think I would, I like to use like um, Octavia Butler's Kindred or Winona Ludduk, Last Standing Woman. So I would, I'd start at different places, but, but the point is I wouldn't march through, here's indigenous women, here's African-American women, here's Chicana women, here's other Latino women, but rather I would like try to, get huge, you know, encompass as much as possible, but do it more dialogically the whole time through the semester, right? So just a way to just keep that dialogue and keep the connections going. Does that kind of make sense? Yes, yes. You, you, um, you use a, a term um, that I think, in, in a sense, you want to have it both ways with race in terms of not overemphasizing it, but also not, or not reifying it. I shouldn't say overemphasizing yeah. it, um, but then also not ignoring it. Yeah. Um, and you, you call it a twofold approach. And then you, you say de-racializing, and then you put the D in those, those brackets. And it, it includes um, well, essentially kind of dealing with race with skill and timing and as I, as you say nuance and you you credit Octavia Butler and and then in a footnote um, Tony Morrison for taking this approach in their fiction where mm -hmm. it is important and in the work but it's not the whole work um, uh, almost as if you are you are getting to race, but in a, a roundabout way. So you do things like like you just said, um, learning the history of these terms, and you talk about um, delaying race conversations till maybe a little later in the course, um, and you and you you also um, talk about tying race conversations um, to larger larger themes and larger questions. Um, so, so is that is that what is that what we are advocating? Kind of to deal with race, but in a in a roundabout way, versus coming in head on. You know, we're going to talk about race. Racism is bad. Here's the documentation of where it's happened. Uh, well, I would say rather than roundabout, in a context in in contextual ways. Okay. So here's the history of race. Here's Here's the history of racialization in the United States, or even better maybe, here's the history of white people. Let's start with the invention of white people. What? You know, you say that to a bunch of freshmen and they're like, what, what are you talking about? Let's look at these race laws. Let's look at, hey, let's talk about enslavement. And did y'all know about indent you know, indentured servitude and this is how it began in the United States? Or let's talk about these, you know, Bacon's rebellion or, so it's not, it's not really, it's, it's not necessarily delayed as much as really thinking through the context where it's going to happen. It's just, cool. And I find that that just makes it a lot harder for people to dismiss it also, mm. right? Well, I mean, you're, it sounds like you're, you're asking questions they haven't heard before. And so therefore they don't have an automatic, you know, oh, that was so long ago kind of, or whatever the dismissal in their pocket might be. Yeah, yeah. Your your discussion of whiteness in in the book I find um, really important, um, but in the end I'm I'm not fully comfortable where you where you end up, and and maybe that's part of the point. Um, and and I think, but it seems also maybe you're not fully comfortable with it either, because on on page seventy eight you kind of you say because sometimes I question my insistence on. Well, in this case, you, you define whiteness um, in, in, in strictly negative terms. So there's not, in, in the way you use the, the concept of whiteness in the book, there's not a possibility for a, a positive white identity. And so then you make, you're very clear not to identify the term whiteness with, with the people who have been called white. Yeah. Um, so, but, so the, the, the two problems that I'm, I have with this language, and they might, they might be the same as yours, and so I just am I'm hoping you can, you can speak to that. Or one is that's not the way most people use the term white, 
right? So in everyday use, when, when we say white, whiteness, people are thinking about the people and not, mm -hmm. not the concept. Right. And then, and then the, the, the second is, um, even if you're very clear that people who have been called white don't have to act white in this negative sense, mm -hmm. um, there's, there's, I wonder if we're, if, if we're trapped then, those of us who are identify as white or been identified as white in this negative, essentially negative category, because we can't reject the category. We can't say, oh, I'm not white. Um, so, so, so I'm, I'm wondering if, if, even if you disassociate it from the people, and even if you talk about, I'm talking about the ide ideology of whiteness, if, if defining it in strictly negative terms kind of makes like a lose-lose situation. Yes, it does. I don't, I, I mean like, and so that, yeah, I don't, I don't really know what to do with whiteness. I don't, and that's why, that's why there's this whole part of me that just really questions, like, is there like, yeah, it, it, I still see it as a problem. I don't like where it ended. This wasn't like a, a glorious conclusion. It was like, a, this is just where I'm at, but hopefully mm. by putting it out there, people can think about other ways. You can't, it's like, like there's, uh, you know, there could be black pride, there could be Chicano pride, but white pride, I think, is gonna be problematic, right? Just the history of it. So I don't need, I don't know what that means. Um, I mean, and the whole thing all started back when I was teaching American Lit, and I was like, we could talk about, you know, I could ask students, so how did Langston Hughes, like, blackness, or how did this, you know, how did that influence, how did, how might that have helped to shape the poetry? But when you ask that, when I would ask that, okay, so Thoreau, how did his whiteness maybe shape things? Like, what does that mean, right? And, and or Emerson, how did his whiteness maybe help shape self-reliance? Well, you take the good quali the good qualities, right? The positive qualities, and then let's look at Frederick Douglass. Hey, he's doing them too. You know what I mean? So it's just like, I think like it was that kind of complication that kind of like got me really thinking about it. Um, and then even the language of like, I don't know. It's just, I, I, I don't like, I don't really like where I ended up in that chapter either. I still have no answers, honestly, because then what about passing? What about people who pass? Like how are, you know what I mean? Like appearance really, really, really matters, but how do we talk about how it matters? I, I'm still, I'm, I'm, st I'm still like really stuck. I, I, I appreciate you, you saying that. I, I think if we could just go back and not invent whiteness, that might be a good idea. Yeah, that would have been a really good idea. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Like maybe if we, maybe if people, maybe if there was a different kind of respect for living beings way mm -hmm. far back. I mean, honestly, if we look at uh, indigenous philosophies, I, I think we see very different understandings that maybe, you know, not that, not that there's, you know, I'm not trying to romanticize things. I'm just saying, you know, but yeah. Right. I, I mean, the, the problem when somebody who is, who is white or who falls in that category says, oh, I'm not white. I'm just a person. I don't see color. I just, yeah. I mean, I'm, on one level, that's actually beautiful, right? As if, like, if, I, I wish we could see people. Um, but the problem with that is is not that it's not a good aspiration, but that it's an impossibility psychologically, historically, economically, in in this historical moment. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We've been like, we are very interpolated into those categories at this point, right? And that's why I used to love to teach um, before they changed the cover. Teaching Octavia Butler's novel Kindred was so great because students, especially especially the white race students. And honestly, depending on assimilation, some other students as well, who aren't, you know, racialized white, they really will do the whole colorblind. I don't see color, I just see people. But then you ask, okay, so then they say they're shocked when they find out the protagonist is black. Like, why did that shock you? What, what was in your head, right? And then, they, then they're again shocked when they find out their husband is white. Why? If these categories aren't operating, what's going on? So I think things like that that kind of, can kind of like, pull back the assumptions that we really have unconsciously held is part of starting really slowly to get to maybe something that could be more equitable or, you know. 
Well, it, it sounds like if, if what our students leave with is where they get to the place that you're at, they don't know anymore, that, that, that's growth. Because yeah. if you have answers about race, they're probably too simplistic. That's very, that's a really good point. Yeah. Um, my, my next question, the, the subtitle of your book um, puts dialogue at the center of your, your pedagogy. And, and in the book, dialogue appears um, in a number of ways. Uh, so on, on, one, on a, like a figurative level, there's the dialogue between the students and the texts they're reading. Uh, on, more literally, there's the class discussions that, that you describe. Um, and s several of your appendixes, uh, which are just so helpful in the back, um, on are on dialogue. So there's, um, try if I find, see if I can find it. Um, li the, your appendix two, listening with raw openness, and then uh, appendix one, dialogue. Some of my presuppositions, um, and then and then throughout the syllabi that you that you include as appendi appendices, appendi, uh, as well. Um, you, you include these discussion questions, uh, and then you ask students to write their own discussion questions. So um, I guess all that just to point out how important dialogue is in the book, how it kind of appears on every page. So my, my question then is, why this focus on dialogue? And in, in the dialogues that you have with students, what do you do to make sure that they are, they are true dialogues as opposed to just like a sequential airing of opinion? Um, I, you know, it's kind of like when I realized how many of my books have transformation in the title, I was like, how did that happen? What does that say about me? Right? So I think dialogue and conversation is really crucial to my worldview. And in a sense, invitation is dialogue, right? Mm. Um, it's that idea of co, it's that idea of doing it in collaboration and conversation. And I think of that Bakhtin phrase that I probably have wrong. The word is half myself and half the others. You know what I mean? Like, it's it's shared. It just really helps to get it, the sharing of it. Um, and in terms of how does it become a genuine kind of um, conversation rather than a series of, how did you, you put it really, really well. What did you ask? Uh, uh, a sequential airing of opinions. Yeah. Um, so I, I give like samples of questions at work and samples of questions that don't. And mm -hmm. honestly, I really encourage them if they have a question that's a yes or no, I encourage them to rephrase it so that it's not yes, no. So it's like, what did you think of this? And then I've like, I've gotten just through a lot of experience, I've found ways to kind of like intervene in that when somebody's pontificating or just like expressing an opinion. I always come prepared with like other passages that would kind of, that could complicate things, mm. right? And and in those cases when that complication hasn't happened at the end of a class, I will start the next class with some complicating things, right? And then like the worst, like what, but I do it sometimes, I call it the Fox News approach. Like if everybody seems to be going down a certain direction and I'm like, whoa, I'll be like, well, you know, some people might say, so why, why do you call that the Fox News approach? Because that's how Fox um, I, sometimes reports on things. Like that's what their commentators do. Some people, or it's been argued, it's that whole removal of the agent, uh, right? Or who's saying it. So I just kind of do that. <clears throat> well, that, that seems useful if you wanted to put an idea, like if you want to complicate things and, and maybe you need to raise an idea that isn't your idea. or that mm -hmm. For the converse, con the conversation, you don't want to own it. To, yes. to put a contradiction on the table. Yes, and I mean, I've, I've, um, I like have been so. I think because I don't like it when people try to force their views on me. Um, I think I've tried super hard not to let the students know what I think. I can't do that anymore because like it's graduate students and I have these books out there. And so they, it would be disingenuous to pretend that, right? So now I don't try to be all coy about it, but I used to be like, I used to, like when I taught surveys of American literature, I would tell them at the beginning, my goal is you will not know exactly what my views are on these things. 
even at the end of the course. Because I really do, I mean, I, I guess I really do think people can think for themselves. We have wisdom inside us, but it gets, it gets like not beat out of us, but we're not encouraged to use it. And so really one of my goals as an educator has always been like, what is your voice? Like, you know, what is, what, what is your wisdom? And strip away all that stuff authorities are saying and do some work because it's not automatic and instant and what is your what is your insight what what are you what can you contribute because i think everybody has really useful stuff to contribute that can help us build the kind of knowledge that can bring positive change i i really like how you frame that in terms of kind of a neutral stance or an impulse towards being neutral as the teacher in terms uh, as something to affirm the wisdom of the students um, I think the the challenge then comes when students say things that are racist or sexist or homophobic, um, and then and then do you do you just not say anything? Or or I'm 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 wondering now if you could respond in the in the in the way that you just said. Is that you could ask the student, is that really your wisdom, or are you just repeating some stereotypes? Well, I don't, I don't know. I just, how do you respond to that? That's cool. That would be an interesting response. Is that really what you think? Or did you hear that somewhere else or whatever? Um, you know, I think, I think at this point, I, at this point right now, I couldn't let it just go by. I couldn't even let it go by to the next class at the worst case scenario kind of situation, because you don't, the, the tricky thing is like, if, if somebody says something like awful, to overtly say to in a way that it's that student that is wrong yeah it is wrong and 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 it needs to be shut down yes but if you silence somebody like really clearly like that then n never mind whether that person will talk or not other people will think that if i say the wrong thing it'll happen to me right yeah so it's so it's the trickiness of how to do that and sometimes it's like we need to t let's take a 5 minute if it's a long class let's take a 5 minute break or I want everyone to do a free write, three minute free write right now. And then with a little bit of time, the teacher can come back and address it. And that's what I would do. And, Cause no, I, you can't let, I mean, you can't let like hateful comments just be okay. Whether it's homophobic or racist or sexist or ableist, those comments can't just be allowed to sit there even overnight or whatever, right? But I do think, I, I do completely think there's ways to address it that doesn't, um, you know, really single out the person who said it. Not to let them off the hook, but like I said, just because it has a subtle effect on everybody else in terms of like their willingness to talk. That's at least what I've thought. Thank you. But I'm still learning. <laughs> it never ends. Me, me too. Um, one of my favorite parts of your book that I that I want to see if you could elaborate on is where you you define your pedagogy um, specifically as a pedagogy of reading, um, and I co I copied out a number of passages where you where you do that, um, where you just des describe how it how it's reading and why it's specifically reading. Um, so 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 for instance, you 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 talk about this that. D with the D bracketed racialized reading as a, as a strategy of of uh, contradicting or, or undoing or a response to what you call as white reading strategies, which you just described um, a second ago in the novel, where where this the the strategy is to assume the characters are white unless it's stated otherwise. So that's a reading strategy. Maybe we don't we don't know about. Um, and then you and then you talk about on um, on on eighty five that that part of the reason reading is important to you and to your pedagogy is um, you said my life has been transformed through reading and I've seen the lives of my students, my friends, and my colleagues transformed as well. So I just wonder if you might elaborate a little more on this idea of of why why it's why reading specifically um, and and what what it means for this pedagogy to be a pedagogy of reading? Yeah, I think, um, I think it, you know, again, like 
going back to the personal, it's because books were so important to me. Like I didn't feel a sense of being affirmed or I, I, I like, I'm so different from my family and I was so different from everybody I grew up around that it was in reading that I could encounter ideas or people a little more like me. So there was that kind of affirmation, like I'm not crazy. Um, and so a sense of community through reading, you know, and then I'm like so lucky that then from that, I could go to like my friendship with Anzal Dua and stuff like that's really cool. Um, so I think that that probably is a lot of what led me into teaching literature and teaching composition and just thinking about the role of writing and reading. Um, so that then when I select texts, I'm super careful about how they end up being in conversation with each other. Right, so that the teaching can happen through that. And then I will take passages, or when we're reading one thing, I'll ask students, so how do you think Anzal Dua might respond to this? And I always phrase it in the, you know, in a tentative, like maybe what, you know, um, so there's lots of room for speculation and stuff like that. And so the texts talk to each other, and then I try to like pull them up, pull things out so that the texts are talking to students so that ideally as they bring their views to it, like transformation can happen, learning and transformation through that. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, let me let me um, ask this then. How, how ideally, you know, you've described being open to students getting what they need to get from the mm -hmm. but in a maybe an ideal hypothetical situation, how will, how will students leave your classes reading? Like, the way that they read, will that will that be different? I think they will be more intentional when they're reading. Um, I think, especially like depending on what I'm teaching, um, I would like to think that they might start like reading their surroundings too for messages, right? Mm. I mean, that kind of goes into this kind of like metaphysical or ontological space. But that idea of looking for relationship, looking for, yeah, looking for relationships where, before maybe they didn't think there could be relationships, whether it's between different kinds of people or different kinds of commonalities or commonalities between the human and the non-human or, you know. Um, in, in the appendix six of your book, which is a, a significant percentage of the total book, you include um, a lot of syllabi for different courses. So we can kind of see in action a bit, what your pedagogy could look like. And one of, one of the most interesting thing in the syllabi are these questions that you include for, um, I think you, you call them as you read. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, uh, so, and, and so of these pages, a lot of them is, is just kind of pages of the questions you ask students to think <laughs> about how they're reading. So I, I'm wondering if you might, comment a little bit on what 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 is going into those questions what makes the why are you ch are you choosing certain questions for a certain way How, why those questions and not another question what what makes a good question mm. I, I guess i'm just asking what's your philosophy of questions yeah okay so the first thing to say is i do not lecture right so my classes are driven through through talking about what we're reading. So therefore, one of them, you know, what makes, so I want questions that could pro, that could stimulate multiple perspectives. I, I do, I try so hard not to ask questions where there's one answer, because that's boring. And then the students are just like, what does she want, what does she want? So I want to make it really clear there's multiple interpretations. Um, I hope that it's questions that will take them to the text, right? So that whole kind of like close reading, um, is part of it. Like, how do you support? How do you support that interpretation? Um, I love to pull out paradox or possible contradiction because I think life is really complicated. And if we can get a little more comfortable with that, and if we can figure out ways to hold contradiction, not forever, but like maybe there's these other things that can arise when we can do that. So those are some of the things. And then like when it's literature courses, um, there's what you know, there's what the conversation was in previous semesters. Um, there's also like, I would try to read scholarship on the stuff so that then I could like bring in, oh, that's another way of thinking about it. So it wasn't just like questions about, that came just, oh, from me reading it, 
but also questions that might have come from the way other people are looking at it. Thank you. I, I have just one or one or two more questions. Um, one one on seventy nine, um, and I think you kind of referenced this this a minute ago. You say um, I, I have uh, even more concerns than I had when I began this investigation ten years ago. And you're you're talking specifically about your investigation of of concepts of race and and whiteness mm -hmm. about kind of the pedagogy as a whole. Um, so this this was uh, over, over. so that was 10 years, you're, you're speaking 10 years before you wrote the book, and now it's 10 years since you've wrote the book or, or more. Um, so what, what are some things you've learned about teaching since, since then? What are some things I've learned about teaching in general or Is teaching whiteness in, and race? Oh, either. Mm. Um, you know, I, I gave away like all my copies of the book and I'm like really regretting that I didn't have a chance to like look back over it. Um, I think, I think teaching whiteness is even trickier now because I think like, for example, um, the language of privilege, especially if it's first generation working class or working poor white race students talking about privilege is really tricky because they can turn off their ears just at the word. Right. Um, so I, I think more about that and I about ways to be effective, you know, and sometimes it's like just talking. OK, let me be up front. This is what the stuff is talking about. Here's how privilege is being used. Sometimes I think, it would, you know, or I will disagree. I'll be like, I think maybe it'd be more useful to talk about rights. Why? Why aren't we calling this rights? Why is it a privilege not to be followed in a store? Why is that a privilege? Mm. Who should be followed in a store? Who deserves that? Right. So like I will try to like turn it turn it on its head. Um, I think I'm even more aware of the importance of um, really holding contradiction, and I think in my own teaching I pull that out even more. And I and I and I think that I try more to point out to students or or stuff how any text, and this especially is, I'm thinking graduate students, um, any text is limited, right? You look at Crenshaw and she, yeah, she's credited for kind of bringing intersectional theory and the discussion into um, feminist theory and women's studies and all, all over the place acad in academic life. But if you look at her early pieces, she's kind of doing a black white binary. Or you look at, I mean, whatever you look at, um, there's going to be limitations and they might be groundbreaking and they might be doing this critique, but they also have limitations. And that doesn't mean we condemn them. It means we say, OK, there's a limitation and this is another area of growth. And I find by doing that, um, I hope it will I hope it will invite them to be less judgmental, both of other people and of themselves, like because I think like striving for perfection can just be very paralyzing. Um, and then the other thing, and I'm still thinking about this, I'm still thinking about trauma and how trauma and how it's encoded in our bodies um, and just everything, how that, I'm, I'm thinking about how that affects the classroom space and how we can teach and think about that. And I'm noticing that this uh, generation of 20 somethings, like the anxiety is really different. So how, you know, how to think about that and how to find ways to kind of help address that even while learning all this other stuff. And I, I think the whole like conversations about triggering and all of that gets at the fact that our students, like our students in their 20s or they experience anxiety in different, I think, from like students of like 15 years ago, at least. Or they have a different language and are really willing to express it. I don't know. You know, so I'm thinking about those things and trying to figure out how to incorporate it more. So, I, so in a lot of my a lot of my classes, I bring in, we start with like five minutes of mindfulness, like maybe it's just breathing, like sit, like sit in, like having them sit in a chair and be aware of the chair, be aware of their feet on the ground, and notice their breath, then try to lengthen their breath, or but you know, but that that can also produce anxiety. So I'm I'm trying to like bring in like practices that like also address the fact that we are physical beings. 
Anna Louise, thank you so much. This is this has been a delightful and helpful for me. I the last thing I want to ask you is just is there anything else that you'd like to say about this book or about these topics or about teaching that I haven't asked you? Um I'm really appreciative of like you reading it so carefully and I really appreciated your questions and how you connected things. Um and yeah, I, I just tried to write a book that was the kind of book I wish I had, you know? And that's why all the syllabi, because I really wished that I had had some examples of syllabi so that I would have, again, it would have been like a dialogue to create. Yeah, so, and there's no, you know, nothing in that book is a final word. I'm still learning. <laughs> well, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful book and it's, it's helped me. Um, and, and thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, even that open-endedness that here's here's here are my questions right now, here are my tentative answers is is also helpful. Oh good. Well, thanks so much. That that's all I have. All right. Well, thank you. Okay. So long. All right, take care.